Well, thank you all for coming. I think we'll start. Although I know a couple more people are coming in. Um, Dr. Alex Wong, as you can see, he has appointments in. He's an assistant professor, occupational therapy, neurology, and psychiatry here at our med school. The name of his lab is Connect Health and Innovative Rehab, the chair lab. He focuses on mobile technology and um, neurobehavioral and patient reported assessment trying to characterize change in cognitive, emotional, and functional um, abilities. Developing new interventions to optimize engagement in folks that have neurological impairments. He's going to share the work of his lab today on mobile health tools. So thank you, Dr. Wong. Thank you. So uh, thanks for Lacey for introductions. Uh, I'm very pleased to come here today. Um, I'm a junior faculty, so uh, for the talk, if you have any feedback or suggestions that how our lab could improve our study, feel free to talk with me. So uh, I'm very pleased, actually, Michael Miller coming today. So uh, he actually helped me a lot. Uh, he's a PT professor, but you know, I under his K-12, and the last few years before I got my green card, he also provided lots of support for me to survive and watch you. So that's why I'm very pleased Michael come here to share with some of my ongoing study on my K award. Uh, uh, as what I said, I have uh, support from my K award. I also have a pilot grant from the PC2. I also have one uh, Lila grant, which is an agency focusing on the disability research uh, that I tried to learn something about sensor and AI. I also got some support from the foundation grant and also the Cancer Simon Center to do something about chemo brain. But I have no other financial disclosure today. So uh, about the learning objectives, uh, today we're focusing on using the smartphone assessment. So something that you and I all have today about the smartphone. Uh, when I was a graduate student, I, I liked that idea, but I remember my old professor told me that job, the idea, the older people would, would, would not using the smartphone but nowadays, 2019, even though all of you might be using the smartphone, maybe I said it's very difficult to get someone that have no uh, smartphone today. So that means we try to use a technique very common use in psychology, in preventive medicine, it's called EMA, Ecological Momentary Assessment. And also I will describe two ongoing studies that we do in our lab. The first one is we try to test this EMA method whether that could be feasible to apply to some people with neurological impairment because we know they have the cognitive impairment that may make them unable to use the smartphone so that's why we try to test the feasibility and then another study that we try to do is there's some beauty by using that ema technique because we know our mood change every day even though hour by hour so that's why we try to see whether this temporal dynamic would affect the people's daily function. By using EMA technique, we could address this kind of issue. So uh, talking about some background, because I know most of our audience today are not from rehabilitation. So uh, as a PTOT physiatrist, neurologist, we have the major focus on three areas. So we're focusing on the home functioning, we try to make sure the people after stroke able to dress themselves, able to go to toilet by themselves independently with very minimum supervision. But Lila, one of the major agencies, uh, also focusing on two other areas that I believe in the current rehab system are missing. First is they also focusing on the people live successfully in the social life, social role in the community. And also for the people, even though they were disabled, they are disabled, but we hope that they are still able to get to employment, to do something very, very productive. So that means in our rehabilitation goal, so we try to help the people to optimize the daily function in terms of the real world function, in real world context. One of the challenges that we are facing as a rehab professional is when we describe daily functioning are very diverse. So I believe because we have different age, different gender, with different people, we do very different set of activities, right? So, so that means we are very challenging because different people do different activities. Particularly nowadays, we, our medicine go to a personalized medicine. We try to target the patient based on the individual characteristics. So that means 
we need a better tool to better characterize the people daily function. In our we have framework, there's some framework that published by the WHO, uh, we call the ICF uh, model. The ICF model have provided us some common language to describe what is functioning. So you can see in this model, uh, in the column, in the, in the middle, they're talking about the body function, different activity like walking, or different participation domain, including the social life, or whether the people are able to be a good citizen in the community. But we also understand all these domains will be affected by the contextual factor, including the environmental factor, and also personal factor, like people with different age and gender, would perform the task differently. If you go to this website, they will give you the description of what the ICF cover. So it's a very comprehensive system because when you click on this uh, button, they will tell you under the activity and participation, they have nine subdomains. And then you further click like something that I'm very interesting about the self-care. If you click here, it can tell you it has further subdomain to talk about this different activity. So let me show you something more interesting. This is also from the ICF. I just translate the picture from there. You can see you and I do every day in this self-care task, right? So uh, in terms of self-care tasks, we do like washing ourselves, we do toileting, we do dressing and eating. We also like to do some household management tasks like do housework and prepare our meals. And also sometimes we also care for our uh, partner, uh, dogs, and others, right? So we have different tasks at home. This is something that we will do at home, right? But as a real person, we also able, we like to do something outside the home. For example, we try to keep ourselves productive. We try to have a work. And also we have some social activity with our friends, partners, and some important others. We also be a good citizens. We try to participate actively in the community. We also have lots of leisure activity, uh, some religion activity, and some of the political activity. We like to participate in the society. As a result, when we, as a we have perfection, when we're thinking about how we better measure about all these activities, that come up with some challenge because this is so diverse, right? But one of the drawbacks right now in our rehabilitation is if you're working at the Bayern Hospital, working with the Dr. G Ruby team, you understand they're using the modified working scale to measure people function. In the rehab setting, like inpatient rehab facility, skill lesson facility, we're using another two common tools to measure the basic home activity. The first one, you can see the bathroom index that we commonly use by the PTOT. We try to measure about after stroke or after other uh, neurological disorder. Uh, we try to measure the people in dependency in, in terms of their participation in feeding tasks, bathing tasks, and all the self-care activities. Another similar tool that we use uh, in the ILF setting is the film instrument. So you can see they measure very similar uh, domains, self-care, eating, grooming, dressing, toileting, and some of the walking capacity. So this is the gold standard in ILF. And even though the Medicare use that one as the outcome to indicate that people get as any reimbursement back to the Medicare uh, recipient. So this is the gold standard that we use in our current inpatient rehab facilities. However, you can see the job at right? Compared with the complexity of what we do every day, they're only focusing on the home household care tasks. Even though some of the people develop the instrument is a self-report task, measure about some of the household uh, activity, like whether you can do grocery, whether you're able to manage your housekeeping tasks and able to manage finance, but they're still unable to capture the variety of different activity we do every day. As a result, we think about any good better measurement tools that we could use in our future clinical trial and clinical practice. That is some summary that we think about the existing measures, the conventional measures. All of our we have functional measures focusing on self-care and household tasks. And also, we mainly 
have our PTOT measure their function inside the hospital. So that means when they go back to home, we doesn't know what they are doing. Even though we have some outpatient service to bring back our patient, but we don't know whether they do good or not because every time our physiatrist ask the patient, how are you doing? They will say, okay. So that's when we are unable to better understand what they are doing when they are go back to their real home. So, and also as what I said, most of our measurement today, we try to use in lab-based assessment. Most of the assessment, maybe we ask them to recall the past seven days, what they do is a retrospective assessment. The problem is we working with a stroke population or some geriatric population, they may have some memory challenge. As a result, we don't know those past seven day instrument can actually give a accurate scoring for reflect their performance. And also, of course, you can measure multiple times, maybe sometime in admission, sometimes you can do when the patient is discharged from the hospital, but we're still thinking about this is not enough precise to understand their change in terms of their function. So what we can do, of course, we learn from the NIH, Dr. Collins and Dr. Worley published a paper in Science 2016, November. Mm -hmm. They're talking about in order to improve the patient-orientated behavioral research, uh, they have some four priorities. One of the priorities is they suggest by using the smartphone or sensor technology could help us to better understanding the real well functioning of our patients. So what they suggest, they suggest we need to focus on the people real life, the community social activity. We also need to have some real time assessment to measure the people function when they discharge from the hospital. We also need something about able to interact with the real world. Instead of uh, talking about the retrospective assessment, we need to measure something at the real time. And more important, we also need some more precise measurement to study about the person functioning, how they react to the real life functions. Thinking about what we can do, uh, that's something I learned from public health, learned from psychiatry. There's some tools that call smartphone DMA. So uh, it's very simple. You can actually install my app in my study. AJ will do that in her study. So uh, it's basically, it's the Apple app that you can free download uh, in Apple. So we set up a different questions into the app. But of course, you as a researcher, you can based on your research question, you can set up your own questions. And all those questions respond given by our participant will be installed into our web cap system. It's a HIPAA compliant. So that means I think about that instrument, that technique is simple. Even though the setup before is challenging, when I work with the technologists, to set up this app is challenging, but as a user perspective, if you are interested to thinking about bring this EMA tools into your study, just talk to me. This app is free. You can set up your questions on your own to answer some question that is important to you. So this is one example. I, I'm interested about post -stroke depression, and then, but I hate the, the old way that we ask about the depression. Ask the people we back the past seven days, how they feel. But I think about yesterday, I was a bad day, but today I'm so excited because I make presentation here. And so, <laughs> so I cannot wait exactly how I could wait the score. Uh, I don't know. So, so that means I, I hate the method that we use as the record method. I like people try to choose asking about the right now, how do you feel method? So uh, basically what, what we do uh, in a study we ask them to, we try to ping them about, give them some alert. We ask them to do five survey a day. Uh, depends on your study. We usually ask the people to do consecutive seven days. Some study do 14 days or even though a month. Of course, you need to think about the patient burden. If you ask lots of questions within one survey, except you pay enough as a reimbursement. Otherwise, I don't think you will get a good completion way. So, but which, but what our experience we learned from our study and also by talking with some of the experts in EMA, try to decide your question within one to three minutes will be more optimal. So there's some advantage that I already go for a little bit. So we know there's some advantage because EMA, as the name referred, is able to measure something in real time, real well, and also try to reduce some of the recall bias. 
And also we understand there's some change for the day uh, by using the EMA technique that could also able to overcome some of the loss from the day-to-day -day variability. So uh, well, something that we think about using EMA into our future clinical trial interventions too. So the reason why I try to promote this, I show you some hypothetical example. Okay, thinking about we do a clinical trial. Uh, let's say we do a clinical trial in two weeks. We try to assess the patient on the baseline assessment at day one. This intervention may be something try to improve the people's mental health. On uh, the day one, we know that he give a score like one, but after intervention, the subject also report is depression is one. That means it looked like our the effect of the intervention was not effective. So is that true? We don't know. Of course, maybe really the intervention doesn't work. But the, the real case is we understand the mental health will vary throughout the day, throughout the hour. That could be something like up and down, up and down. Maybe, you know, sometimes the subject come to our lab or clinic on their bad day. Even though they come on the uh, post assessment period, they also come in the bad day. As a result, we cannot see any event. But if they come in another day by chance, because of different reasons, we find that in this picture, you can see our treatment effect sounds to be positive because the baseline, they have higher symptoms, but after treatment, they reduce their symptoms. So that means maybe we need a better method rather than using the traditional like HQ line to ask our patient to recall what they do because we are unable to capture the precise temporal dynamic across the days. Another example, this is something very interesting. Uh, some of the good paper published in JAMA Psychiatry already, they're thinking about, actually, we need to use the standard deviation as our indicator for indicate recovery. So let's take about these two examples. Both of them, if you ask them about the past seven days, if they can do in that way, ask them to get an average call about the past seven days, they will tell you on average how they feel. Like let's say they, they respond, respond to the two. But the actual is you can see these two subjects are very different. Maybe they have different, different, different like emotional regulation capacity. For the subject two, you can see uh, his or her emotion actually up and down. So you can see some of the like uh, pioneer using EMA like uh, Dr. Trove. Uh, is actually a misu. She uh, he, he indicated that actually we can use the stability as our indicator to show as a uh, health and recovery indicator in our clinical trial. Also showed you some real data that we collect last year. So uh, it's a stroke subject that we know we using the NIH toolbox, which is a uh, cognitive assessment developed by the NIH we found that the subject, at least on the right-hand side, had better cognition than, the, than the, the subject on the left side because he has a lower overall cognitive score than the right one. So you can see what they actually do in their daily life. If you see the subject on the right, so you can see this subject had better cognition, right? So you will expect they may be more active. They may participate in more high-level adaptive activity. That means you can see overall, he could spend more time to do the IADL, but instead of doing less time on doing some passive research activity, just like watching TV. So they spend less time on watching TV. Compared with this subject, you can see overall the pattern, they spend more time to do more passive research activity uh, than, than the high functional one. But one subject, you cannot tell much, but at least you can see the pattern. For the people with better cognition, the emotional regulation is also better, you can see. Their different mood symptoms are more stable. They have less somatic symptom campaign compared to the one with lower cognitive inhibition control subject. They are, their mood symptoms are very low throughout the days. So I just try to give you some uh, uh, demonstration to see each subject actually when they live in the uh, uh, real life, their mood change, their function change. Everything changed. So that means we need a precise tool to measure those change. So talk about the summary of the benefit of the EMA.
So that avoids some of the retrospective recall bias. That could increase our ecological validation of our assessment because that measure at the real time real world. And more important is right now we're thinking about the individual approach. Using this approach can give you lots of the time series data that you could do whatever analysis that out of my capacity in order to know how the people change relate to different correlates. And more important, this is very nice. This I captured from one test book talking about EMA. We are able to use a better lens to study about individual person, to study about the micro level trend of their daily function. Okay, so after talk about some beauty of using EMA, let's talk a little bit about the stroke. Uh, I, I, I just assume in this table, I know maybe some of you are neurologists, maybe working with neurological population, but I also serve some people that not work in this area. I try to give some basic information. What is stroke? Uh, but this is some data from the AHA American Heart Association, American Stroke Association. Uh, you can see uh, right now, most of the stroke patients are ischemic stroke, and most of them are actually mild stroke. And also, the people suffer from age is being younger. So most of the stroke patients have the first stroke about 50. It's pretty young. And most of them not just have the physical motor problem, they also live in with the cognition problem and also have the uh, uh, depression. So you can see about one third of our, uh, our stroke patient also with the depressions. This is the overall picture published by different other study over the world. Let's see something in our what's you picture. So uh, uh, you can see this is our patient admin to our bank hospital. So uh, since 2017, so we have about 23,000 patients admitted to our banks. You can see most of our patients are mild stroke. And also, we, in terms of what kind of service they receive after discharge from the acute management, most of them, because they are mild, they do not have major uh, uh, motor deficit and they do not have any like uh, problem in doing basic ADL. As a result, they find to recall clinical recovery. They are good. So that means most of them are going back to home without major service. But you can see at least uh, most half of them will go back to home. Some of them may get home health. Some of them may get their outpatient service. But majority are not getting inpatient service. So I try to put a case example. This is something I learned from my mentor, Eric. He always did that. So this is a typical case we found out uh, uh, in our, uh, our patient clinic. So uh, Katrina, of course, is a fake name. So uh, it's a 68 years old uh, lady. She lived independent, even though with different multiple conditions before she got stroke. After stroke, we are one of the good stroke center. As a result, she did a very good in terms of the stroke acute management. And Dr. Lee team decided to discharge her to back home with some outpatient service. So, but unfortunately, we found her after three months, people thinking about the rehab is done. We found that uh, she's different. She's actually stay at home most primarily of her time, do nothing, and also lose some opportunity to engage with their old friend, partner. Majority should just stay at home. We're thinking about why and what we can do in terms of better describe recovery. So we think about, of course, is there any better approach to measure people recovery, even though the people transit soon into community? And also, uh, would the EMA technique can help us to better understanding what they are doing, how they feel, how they perform in the real life situations? This is not my hypothesis. There's some other study published in a good journal, like this one published in Stroke, that identify even though we define these people have no major disability because the modified working scale less than two, that means they are clinical recovery from our standpoint. But you find that about half of them still living with cognitive impairment, about half of them with the challenging in reintegrate into society, and about one third of our stroke patients have living with the post-stroke depression. Even though they are what we're thinking about, they are clinical fully discovery subjects. Another paper very similar to 
the early paper from more focusing on cognition. Also, they only choosing the subject from the score with MLS 0 and 1, that means low disability. They also found that actually 83% of the patients they study have at least one cognitive impairment. And even though about half of the subject have more than three cognitive area in terms of attention, executive control, episodic memory, and different functioning. So that means even though in our traditional model, we're thinking about they are good, they are okay, they can go back home. But actually, they are still living with lots of residual impairment in their life that they need to deal with uh, in order to become more productive. So, share two studies. The first one is we're thinking about feasibility. EMA have been applied in general old adult population, like Dr. Wimsey from Psychiatry uh, published a paper uh, to demonstrate EMA could be applied to general old adult. Like my friend uh, Dr. Moore also published a paper at UCSD to indicate old adult with HIV positive is still feasible to using this EMA technique. Uh, of course, I try to ask a question for stroke and other neurological population because we understand they're also living with lots of cognitive challenge to see whether they are still able to using the EMA techniques. As well, I said, I tried to study our feasibility. Of course, as a feasibility study, we try to compare with some gold standard, which is something we commonly use in the lab. This is the study protocol. We bring them to the lab two times. The first time we bring the subject into the lab uh, is try to tell them about our study. We also educate them how to using the EMA device. Of course, we also do lots of the lab-based assessment, the gold standard assessment. For example, we try to uh, uh, use different neuropsychological testing to test about their cognition. We also using lots of our uh, uh, PTOT test to test about their functional capacity. We also using the patient report survey to ask about different mood and uh, somatic symptoms. After that, the subject can using the iPod touch we give them, or if they are uh, iPhone user, they can using their own iPhone. So, and then we ask them to start the protocol. We follow them for 14 days and each day, each day we give them five times survey randomly throughout the days. And after that, we invite them to come back to return the iPod touch. And also we complete the rest of assessment. And also we do some post EMA interview to talk about their feedback experience about using the EMA uh, uh, tools. So uh, because I don't have much time, but I just want to show you some of the lab-based assessment we use to cover. So we, we actually measure more than that, but, uh, but for the purpose of presentation, I focusing on cognition and mood, I try to give you some of the uh, battery that we use to measure these two functions. We're using the marker. It's a very uh, brief screening test that we use in the clinic to test the people cognition. And we also particularly interesting on the frontal loop system. So that means we ask about, we measure three aspects of executive function, including inhibition control, working memory, and attention strictness. And also, we're using different lab-based functional capacity test, which try to test people ADL and IADL functioning. We're also using different patient report survey as a paper pencil or put into the iPad. Uh, for example, some lots of the people are working in mental health using PHQ line to measure depressive symptoms. We're also using something very common in the neurological population called BSI to measure about the depression symptom and somatization symptom uh, 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 in our stroke patient. Um, we also learned something good from the Palmer system. They also developed the neural code, which is a system very similar to the Palmer's, but mainly target for neurological disorder. We extract the one that measuring the cell report counter campaign into our study. So, there's something interesting to show you. This is the app that we gave our patient. You can see, as what I said, they can use either the iPod Touch device, or if they are iPhone user, they can use it on their iPhone back. We just teach them how to download, or even though our research uh, personnel help them to download to their app. After that, 
So uh, we give them some question that we modify from, from the DCSD study. So because we are interested about daily function, we ask them at that moment, if they get the poll, they answer the survey, we ask them at this moment, what are you doing? At this moment, of course, if I can do the survey, I'm, I'm on the meeting with you. So I, I can select the activity, and at the same time, we ask them lots of the self appraisal questions. How well, how satisfied, how much help they need to do on a particular activity. Of course, we have a series of items measuring about different boosting terms. Something very interesting, we also build a mobile cardiac assessment. Uh, so, but I don't cover uh, this mobile assessment data in this presentation, but we can talk later if you're interested about mobile cardiac assessment, because in the study, we, we know that there's some MCI myocardial impairment. Over the day, they change along the day in terms of the cardiac functions. So that means we start doing the mobile cardiac assessment. So there's some additional item because we know we want to know where they go. So that's why we also ask some questions about where are you? And also we understand in rehab, the social support is a very important system for recovery. So that means we also ask some questions about who is with you and how satisfied with that social interactions. Uh, some somatic symptoms just show you the item that we use in our study. So relate to the result. So uh, something very impressive. This is actually over my expectation. Right now we have 52 subjects. You can see, even though the subject with the lowest completion weight, he's still able to complete 13%. But you can see about 48, that means 82% of our subject able to compete over 50% of our EMA survey, which is very good. So the minimum number of the EMA for doing data analysis will be six because we have the five day survey per day. If you want to study about the between day variation, you need one more. So that means the minimum number of data points for EMA analysis will be six. But you can see, of course, we don't try to do uh, data analysis for the subject only compete six survey. We try to analyze those subjects to do uh, able to complete the EMA survey by more than 50%. So that means in our subscription analysis, I select these 48 subjects for doing data analysis. Overall, if you remember, I also asked the subject about how they feel about our EMA mobile tools. You can see they are satisfied with that. They also thinking about using that one is comfort. And ask about how difficult when they're using these mobile tools. Most of them not feel difficult at all. And uh, we also found that they kind of prefer using the mobile technique than the tra traditional method. So this is more like a acceptability, right? But the key question that we try to know is whether this method able to answer some of things, some of uh, questions that I really like to ask, what they are doing at home. So, so that means we try to understand the time use data. So I think this is aligned with the clinical pictures. Most of our stroke survivors, remember, those stroke survivors are the community developing stroke survivor. So they are chronic stroke. They already passed stroke post stroke for at least three months, even though some of them may be five years, 10 years in our study. So uh, majority of them uh, actually stay at home in their wake up times. So uh, that align with the clinical pictures. And then we try to think about what they are doing. We try to categorize into different high level domain. We find that most of our participants mainly doing some pests, uh, maybe the color cannot see the difference, but the 31% here is they mainly stay at home to do some passive research activity, such as watching TV, smoking. Of course, because our population are not really old, so uh, uh, what, uh, about 30% of the people are still doing some work related IADL activities. And we think about most likely our stroke participants uh, with whom, and we found that, which is good result because uh, we found that most of our stroke survivors, most of their time are, uh, are with their parlor, with their family members. Uh, about 40% of the time they spend at home alone. But very interesting, 23% of the uh, participants always with their pet. 
So for, for me, it's nice because I try to think about whether the social support instruction will be kind of the future intervention can be provided by the PTOT. I can see most of the time they have the support. Maybe that may be some good way that we could train the caregiver to how to better handle uh, by working with the uh, patient in terms of the recovery intervention. So there's some lots of data, but I try to make it simplify. Um, first of all, of course, we try to see some correlation, whether the result makes sense to provide that, to provide that our EMA technique measures something valid, right? So you can see here, the people get older, they spend more time at home. I think that makes sense. And the people get employed, so that means they are working, they are less likely to stay at home. Good. And also, that of course makes sense. If the people get married, most of the time with the spouse and partner. And here, you can see when the people get older, they will spend less time to do work and ideal activity, which is all uh, expected directions. And the people who are employed, of course, will do more IADA work-related activities. And then we try to look at another analysis, try to do some correlations, the relationship analysis between the different daily function activity that we measure by the EMA and also correlate with the lab-based content assessment. You can see overall for the people with better Content functions measured by the marker, they spend less time on doing some basic activity. We will guess maybe they spend more time to do something productive, like IA their work activities. And the TMT is a measure of processing speed. Uh, Indicate that the people have better processing speed, they will be more likely to do some IA their work activity. For me, that makes sense because lots of our work tasks require speed tasks. Is a speed task that means they are related, right? Stroke interference is a cognitive function measure about the inhibition control. Whether you could inhibit the distraction and focus on the task. We found that the people with better inhibition control, they spend less time on doing the basic ADL and also spend less time to do some intellectual activity. For, for this part, we think about why, because we expect that might be positive relationship. But when we look at how we define intellectual activity, we find that lots of our activity are like reading, playing card game, that may be fact this is more like a uh, activity don't uh, show up, it's not really intellectual activity here. So we try to test by doing some comparison tests, we find that the people with better inhibition control also like to spend more time in IA Dell and work. Okay, this is something uh, interesting because we try to validate uh, the EMA daily functioning item will be correlated with the functional capacity we use in our clinic. So of course we need to find out some very strong correlations, right? So you can see for the lab-based clinical measure like Laudan, or at the castle, mainly used by our OT colleagues, we found that they have a model correlate with the EMA measure IA Dell and work. So this is just another uh, demonstration to show you there's some correlation between the lab-based measure versus the EMA-based measures. And also you can see if the people spend more time that we fed by the lab base, they will likely to spend less time on the EMA measure passive laser activity. That makes sense for me too. But you can see something very interesting. We expect bubble index is a measure to measure about the functional capacity. Uh, but we found that the relationship was negatively correlated with the physical activity. We, we're thinking about this is something surprised us. And then we try to understand what is the possible reason. Uh, of course, first of all, we're thinking about our subject is too high function. You can see uh, most of our subjects are sealed. Most of them are already, uh, we call totally independent. So that means that may make, make, we have very slow variance to do that calculation. Of course, another reason is if you look back to our time use pie chart, most of our subjects only spend 5% of their time to doing physical activity. Maybe because they are running, 
they don't like to do our survey at the same time, right? So, so we guess. So that means that provides some other indicator. That means maybe we need to use some Fitbit or other passive data collection method to better capture physical activities. So there's some, we, in addition to measure the EMA measure daily functioning, we also measure about the mood and other somatic symptoms using EMA. We also try to correlate with the gold standard. So uh, that provides some conversion uh, validity because you can see all the score correlated highly with the EMA measure spread response. That makes sense because the, this is some kind of like stress response item. And also you can see when we ask about the somatization, you can see that they have a better correlation with the somatic spend symptom measured by the EMA compared with other items measure different aspects. It's just like another example, you can see the lab-based content campaign will be more highly correlated with the EMA measure candidate com uh, campaign items compared with the other. So this only demonstrate the good conversion validity. So overall, we found that which is feasible. And then we are thinking about that could be a complementary tool that can add into our clinic to better measure the people rather than just using the standard measure in the clinic. So uh, as what we said, the study limitation may be because we focusing on mild stroke in the future, maybe we like to generalize to better border population like more severe stroke. And also we have some unexpected direction result on the physical activity. As a result, we suggest we need to use uh, another technique like physical tracker to better measure physical activity. So um, I, I, I have 15 minutes, five minutes. Great. So, uh, so uh, another study that I, I like to talk about briefly because I will come is try to tell you why EMA can provide another platform for precise precision medicine because they could study about the temporal dynamic. So why I like to move on to this direction is this is my older study. So it's uh, funded by a NIH pilot program. What we try to do is using a secondary data analysis approach to study about the relationship between depression and functional outcome. So like FIM score. So most of them, we, when we do our analysis, we do a cross-sectional analysis, something like this, in a single time point, just a snapshot. But we understand actually that people who have higher depression will be more likely have higher depression at three months follow up. This person will be more likely to have higher depression at 12 months follow up, same as follow up. As a result, that come up with some uh, we call autocorrelation problem when we do analysis. And also we, we understand that people have lower depression at the distress time point will be more likely to help to have the people have better recovery on functional status at three months. Do the same for functional status because we are OTPT, we try to help the people to improve functional status. We think that if we can improve the people function, that could also help their psychological recovery. So as a result, my old work tried to demonstrate a model. We reviewed a cost like SDM model. We found that expected relationship. So we try to understand actually uh, the depression measure at this chart will affect the functional status at three months follow up. Same for the discharge as three months follow up to 12 months discharge. The direction will be by, by direction relationship. You can see the functional outcome also improve the depression at later time point. So, which is good. That tells you some temporal dynamic and all these two constructs are by directly relate with each other. But the job is, this is not precise enough. So this is the reason why I'm thinking about in the future, that is what we are doing now. So we, we need to another platform that could provide some of the more precise measurement in order to measure some good data outside the clinic. When the, particularly when the people discharge back to home. Uh, this is something I told you, we really need a tool to zoom in to study about the people micro level trend of behaviors. So this is the real data we collect for that for the eight subjects, right? So as what I said, it's really, really uh, uh, changed 
four hours a day. This is one single day. The second day, da 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 da, da to fourteen day. So this is something related to the cell uh, about the cell reported depression. Right now, I feel depressed. That I am. You can see one bright color represent one subject. You can see within the study period, each of the subject vary the depression over time. So uh, same for lack of interest. Another important cause under the DSM, DSM to define major depression disorder. Uh, can't be complained, and even though fatigue, you can see they have lots of variations within the subject, even though between the subjects. Because if you find there's only one single blue line, that means all the subjects are the same. But right now, we set the program, we put the uh, subject, if they have similar function, we will give you one line. You can see, even though between subjects, they have lots of variations. So, so that means this technique can show you some of the within subject and between subject variability. Even though daily function, the cell appraisal of daily function, they, they are different. So you can see also, they, 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 they cell report their level of performance different across the days. So this is something, uh, maybe we don't have time to go through the details, but you can see what we try to do is we try to demonstrate the technique by using EMA, by building different HLM model to set up the relationship. The, Two constructs that we are interested are related on the same time point, different time point, or even though the relationship may be fit, and the daily function also affect the most incomes, but more precise way by using EMA. Uh, because of the time, I think I, I may better to skip this slide because just something very fancy. I have my doctoral student in Jean help me to run the HLM model, try to study about moment to moment dynamic between the most incomes and daily function performance, you can see our result find out the same time uh, associated with daily function at the same time point, and also the fact it affect the T plus one time point on daily functioning. Do something also interesting. Uh, we try to fit the angle. We try to see, put the daily functioning as the predictor to predict the outcome of the uh, psychological symptom. We also find some of the good result here. Okay. This is the last slide. I, I try to say, uh, what is the reason why I, 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 I do this second study? Because I try to see whether we could build something we call just in time mobile intervention in the future. So because we are able to better measure people daily functioning, we are better to measure people mood functioning. And we also found that they have some relationship within these two constructs. So that means in the future, if we can prompt the subject to do something good in terms of activity like exercise or some uh, value activity, they could improve their mood. At the same time, if we're able to help the people to better control their mood, they will do more meaningful activities, right? So this is something that uh, I'm now working with the design student in Danford, uh, sorry, in the Danford campus. What they try to help us to build is we call mm -hmm. behavioral activation which is a psychological principle, is based on what we do in the second study, is we try to, to ask the people to do more meaningful activity because we believe that could help them to reduce their, uh, reduce their depression. So there's some principle, I, can I cannot tell you in two minutes, but there's something we're thinking about important. We need to set goal. We need to help them to monitor what they are doing. We also need to do lots of scheduling to help them to put into task. And more important, at the same time, we need to check their mood based on the mood score that will provide some guided activity that they need to do. For example, if we find that they are on no mood and we may ask them to do some, uh, kick them out of the home to do walking. So, so this is kind of idea that I, we would like to move on. Hope that it will be my first out one study in the future. So, uh, but I want to give credit to all my lovely design students to help me to beat this very sexy graph. <laughs> okay. That's all today. I think I need some time to for discussion. <laughs> I noticed um, that uh, on one slide it looked like on your EMA mm -hmm. during the fail making retest. Mm -hmm. Are you timing that or looking at error? Uh, we're using the uh, both. We look at the reaction time and also the error. Uh, when we program into our study. So this program to measure time. 
I measured uh, the time and number of errors both. And it also looked like it's a truncated form of trail making. Is that correct? Uh, it's very interesting. What, what we tried to do is we actually uh, work with the Apple Research Kit. Those engineer is able to put the uh, stimuli in different location. So, so that means every time when you see uh, the, the bubble, the circle on different location. So even though every child, every item, when the subject see on the single uh, survey, they will see very different. So, uh, so uh, we try to avoid the learning effect. You know, we, we, we know the cognition assessment if we do every day, they, they may learn. So that's why we try to make some variations. So yep. it, it is truncated then? Uh, truncated means... Uh, it's, it's not the full pair of making. Uh, you can see, right, we don't have the same number of stimulus by built inside the smartphone, yeah. but we try to using the same concept that we try to build into our smartphone. So yeah, you are right, it's a truncated version. Is this published uh, No, so, uh, but this is something that our students like to work with with different population. So uh, I know Jason from Alzheimer's Center do similar work on uh, Alzheimer's disease population, but uh, I, I do something similar, but in stroke. So, uh, and also something very good is we build up on the Apple system. So that means everything, even though you would like to build a new uh, content assessment, uh, we can go for that direction. But for our lab, because we're interested on the frontal loop system, we mainly build on the free uh, test tip on executive functions. Go ahead. Uh, have you done any extensive research on uh, with non-stroke victims on memory loss and memory retention? Uh, we don't, but my mentor Eric Lance actually have a ongoing study, he called Meta study, to study about the effect of exercise, mindfulness practice, or combine to see uh, by, by using EMA to track the effect on those interventions. So uh, I don't have time to share, but we have a paper uh, to be published to study about the eco emotional dynamic by using some of his baseline data. Uh, is, is memory loss or, or memory retention, is that related to, uh, or is it a neurological disorder? Uh, that might be not. I'm not, I may not be the least person to answer this, okay. uh, but, but anyhow, so the reason why I think about even though the people with me memory problem can use that one because we try to ask at this moment question that could help uh, lots of our patients with the memory problems. Michael? Alex, it seems like it's really a measurement issue and you talked about a tremendous amount of different variables. Are there particular variables you think would be important to focus upon moving forward? For instance, it seems like some of these might be better measured up otherwise, in using other methods, but maybe there's just a couple of real key ones to focus, you know, both your energy and the, the patient's abilities to get some, some real critical measures in there. So what, what are those key outcomes? Yeah. Uh... I think Michael asked a very uh, critical questions because EMA can just a measurement tool to ask lots of different constructs you like. Uh, for me, because I try to think about how can we build a mobile intervention, we're focusing on, of course, uh, the post-stroke depression. So uh, if you see my second study, uh, all the items that we try to capture are based on the PHQ line, which is a gold standard for measured depression. So uh, we hope that by, by better study about, about the relationship between post-stroke depression and daily functioning, we can using the BA behavioral activation theory to guide us to build a better intervention for the mobile platform. So of course, I, I will tell you based on my personal interest and I find one third of our stroke patient living with depression, I will go to that direction to study about post-stroke depression as the first study in our lab for mobile intervention. Oh, yeah, so have you um, figured out from the samples you've been studying uh, how many samplings do you need in order oh. to get a robust answer? I mean, do you have to do every day for two weeks? Could you do a week? Could you do twice? 
and yeah. look at that. The, the sampling issue is a very complicated issue in EMA. Uh, some of the advanced statisticians using simulation method to help me to write the power section in my brain. Uh, we target about 115 subjects for the overall subject. If we want to use the SD, the duration per person, as the indicator of recovery. But you can review lots of other EMA literature. They may have publication about 25 subjects, 30 subjects, because you know, if you gather more data points per subject, you need lower number of subjects. Of course, it depends on what kind of question you ask, but we try to do something very challenging. We try to using the uh, variation per person as our indicator in the future. And then our biostatisticians suggest me to collect 115 subjects for these projects. One more question. Yeah. So you said if the, sub, if the participant had an iPhone, they could use their own device, or you provided the iPod iPod device. To touch. Um, did you provide service to them as well, or did they all already have like cellular oh, data or Wi-Fi? Oh, which is uh, good questions. I told you uh, when we build about this uh, 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 mobile technology, we think about whether we would like to give them the data frame. But the beauty for our to build up on the record is even though the subject without any data plan uh, with them, we are still able to give them the survey to collect. So the data just stored in their phone, when they reconnect to the data, like go back, we are able to export the data back to our webcam washing system. So at their second visit or whatever, you could download. Yeah, but only drawback for that approach is we are unable to monitor their performance daily. So, so that means we need our research participant, uh, our assistant to regular call them to see if any problem they have for those subset of participation. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for that interesting work. Okay. Thank you.